Take a look at the deepest yearning of civilization's builders, and you will see the yearning for paradise. A desperate longing to recover the lost golden age. For the Egyptians, this was the revered golden age of Ra. For the ancient Sumerians, it was the golden age of An. A theme reverberating around the world. But now look at the deepest fears of the same peoples, and you will see the doomsday anxiety. Terror of the Great Catastrophe. This is not an isolated memory, but a memory inseparably linked to the theme of the ancestral paradise. The remembered events were not just catastrophic, they were the events that brought the Golden Age to an end. When the sky was overrun by chaos, two seemingly incompatible motives trace to a common experience, and both bring us back to the one story told around the world. Hence, the implication cannot be avoided. Something extraordinary was remembered by the first Sky Watchers. Something profound and yet unexplained. In the course of these submissions, trying to maintain a sense of direction, chronology, the physical evidence, dynamics, all of these issues intertwine. Moreover, various individuals exploring catastrophic ideas will work from different perspectives and will hold different ideas as to what constitutes the most solid ground for a starting point. The solid ground in David Talbot's orientation to these things is the substratum of human memory. It is this substratum that raises the deepest historical questions and sends us scurrying about to find answers, even if the answers upset various specialists, asking them to reconsider the most fundamental assumptions of their discipline. My own conclusion came as a great surprise. The substratum of human memory is incredibly dependable, but others would consider that to be a losing proposition out of the gate. So there's an immediate problem of communication. Just to avoid misunderstanding, Jungian collective memory, though Jungian archetypes may indeed come into the equation in a bigger picture, for now, I mean the common mythical, symbolic, and ritual themes of widely separate cultures. Another way of putting it might be points of agreement concerning remembered events. In this inquiry, I think there are certain things we can all agree on. The truth is unifying because it eliminates contradiction. When you are looking for the truth of a matter, any significant and incontrovertible fact is good news, because it can save you from heading in the wrong direction. It's particularly good news if it compels you to change your mind, because in doing so, it has liberated you from a burden that could only grow. When it comes to the more fundamental errors, a whole lifetime could be spent on a dead end. Once, the world was quite a different place. In the beginning, we were ruled by the central luminary of the sky, the motionless sun, presiding over an age of natural abundance and cosmic harmony, creator king, the father of kings, the founder of the kingship rites. And this earliest remembered time was the exemplary epoch, the golden age, the standard for all later generations. But the ancient order was disrupted, and the entire cosmos fell into confusion. And we're still in confusion. We are an upside-down species with amnesia. When the universal monarch tumbled from his appointed station, then the hordes of chaos were set loose, and all of creation slipped into a cosmic night. The gods themselves battling furiously in the heavens. And yet, from this descent into chaos, a new world emerged, now reconfigured, but with the universal monarch himself. Rejuvenated and transformed, assuming his rightful place in the heavens. 
The truth can be demonstrated by following certain rules. Call these our rules for re-envisioning human history. Our first rule is we will always work from the general motif to the specific. A second is only broadly reoccurring themes count as evidence, particularly in the early stages of the reconstruction. And there is a third rule. Earlier recorded versions of the reoccurring themes must be permitted to explain later variants. Okay, just one more rule. We must allow ancient drawings to illuminate the myths and rites while permitting the myths and rites to illuminate the drawings. This last rule is crucial because around the world ancient sky gazers drew remarkably similar pictures of things that do not exist in our skies today. And the things depicted are the subjects of the myths and rites. Though this vital truth has not been generally recognized, either by catastrophists or by mainstream scholars. I mean, mainstream, just forget about it. They would just dismiss this out of hand. You know, Jupiter what? Saturn what? Let's take one story a step further. And how many archetypal figures of myth are there? There are seven. I say with smug assurance. Well, there are just seven. But it all depends on how you count these guys and gals. For openers, we know there is at least one archetypal figure because he is the god whose ancient name was One. The primeval, all-encompassing unity. This figure is, of course, the universal monarch. The subject of our One story. So our One story might be subtitled The Story of One. Examples would include Egyptian Atum and Ra, Sumerian An and Yutu, Akkadian Anu and Shamash, Hindu Varuna and Brahma, Greek Uranos and Kronos, Aztec Omitiatl and Quetzalcoatl, to name a few. Our claim is that all other stories, all other archetypal figures when investigated at the core, lead back to the one story intersecting with this story in the most remarkable and explicit ways. Here are the other figures. The Queen of Heaven. Wherever you find the universal monarch, you will find, close at hand, the ancient mother goddess, the goddess whom the Sumerians called Inanna. The Queen of Heaven, and the Babylonians Ishtar, and the Egyptians Isis, Hathor, and Sekhmet, each with numerous counterparts in their own and in other lands, and virtually all of them viewed symbolically as daughter or spouse of the Creator King and the mother of another equally prominent figure, the warrior hero. This is the great national hero, originally the Demiurge, the servant of the Creator King, but passing into later myth as the laboring warrior, messenger, or servant of a great chief a regional ruler. He is the Hercules archetype, a figure combining knowledge and brutish strength. Quick wit and episodic foolishness. He defeats the chaos monsters in the primordial times, and he reconfigures the world with a personality clearly dominating the later mythical chronicles. The warrior hero is the prototype of the famous tricksters and buffoons of later myth and folklore. Flowering into thousands of tribal variations, Egyptian Shu, Horus, and Sept, Sept, Akkadian, Nurgle, Hindu Indra, Norse Thor, Greek Ares, Hercules, the Aztec, Huitzilopochtli, I finally got that one down. Also in North America, Coyote and Raven, but countless others as well. Because the warrior hero is far and away the most active figure in the myths. Next is the Primal Seven. These satellite figures are presented in a variety of contexts as wise men, patriarchs, seers, children, dwarves, stones of fate, stars, orbs, heads of chaos monster. They are the first reason for the sanctity of the number seven in ancient symbolism. 
Then we have the Chaos Monster. Here we meet the darker, more menacing powers possessing the often hidden link to aspects of the Mother Goddess or Warrior Type Hero, Warrior Hero Type. Of these darker creatures, none is more prominent than the Cosmic Serpent or Dragon, the monster that descends on the world to preside over the twilight of the gods, and whose ultimate defeat signals the birth of a new age, or symbolically, a new year. Babylonian Tiamat, Egyptian dragon of Apep, Greek Typhon, but within every culture endless variations will be found, hundreds of monsters, repeating the primeval catastrophe, each providing a different nuance, a different accent, a different way of remembering the cosmic agent of Doomsday. Then we have Chaos Hordes. These are the companions of the monster figures. They are the swarming powers of disorder and calamity, the friends of darkness. Flaming, devouring demons, which so many magical rites were contrived to ward off. From the Norse Valkyries to the Greek Aranis. From the Babylonian Pazuzu. Pazuzu. Demons to the Egyptian fiends of Set. Every culture remembered the onslaught of these chaos demons. Moving across the heavens as a, a sky darkening cloud and ushering in the cosmic night. In their earliest expressions, they do not just announce the primeval catastrophe. They are the catastrophe. Then we have the rejuvenated creator king. Lastly, there is the compelling personality of the dying god king, often a resurrected or transformed figure whose spring back to life is reflected in the dramas of the new year, symbolically the passing from one age to another. Though his identity is inseparably tied to the universal monarch, he nevertheless emerges in distinction from that god as his son, the younger version or rejuvenated form of his own father. The examples would include the Egyptian Osiris, Akkadian, Marduk, the Persian Ahura, Mazda, Norse Baldur, Hebrew Yahweh, Phoenician Bel, Greek Zeus. So there are just seven archetypal personalities of myth, if you count them in this way. We are not separating the chaos monster into its male-female aspects, so we count only one monster. We are separating the universal monarch into his elder and younger versions, however. End of part one. We arrive, therefore, at our first critical juncture, an acid test. Can a mere seven categories actually encompass all of world mythology? While there are numerous complexities and ambiguities to slow us down periodically, the vast majority of well-documented regional figures of myth can be readily identified in terms of these archetypes, and the implications are quite astounding if you set this principle beside the different theories offered to explain myth in the past. Not a single theory proposed before Velikovsky opened the door will account for the archetypes, the bedrock of myth. The implications become all the more astounding when you begin to see that each of the archetypal figures is linked in no uncertain terms to the one story. I'll give some key examples in the next few submissions. The universal structure to ancient memory is present. The six additional biographies retell the story of one, but each with a slight turn of the prism, putting the focus on a particular aspect of the story and providing more colorful action and detail. What an amazing principle, if true. Of all the skills that the independent researcher might bring to his inquiry. None will prove more crucial than, than that of pattern recognition. There is structure to myth, structure that has never been sufficiently acknowledged. Structure implies coherence and integrity between the parts. Clearly, human imagination must have gone wild to have produced the incredible vistas of the ancient mythscape. But structure is there too, and structure means that human imagination was not operating in a vacuum. What could have unleashed human imagination in this way, while yet inspiring a universal myth? 
It's nothing less than the most awesome and traumatic experiences in human history, I would say. And that was by Dave Talbot. I ran into it just surfing around on this page that you'll find a link to in the description. And it's a uh, Saturn Theory overview. It's called Thoth. Some early Talbot from 97. theory holds that a unique congregation of planets preceded the planetary system, familiar to us today. For earthbound witnesses, the result was a spectacular, at times highly unified apparition in the heavens, the obsessive focus of human attention around the world. For more than 20 years, Dave claimed that this fear-inspiring image once stretched across the northern sky towering over ancient star worshippers. He termed this planetary arrangement the polar configuration because it was centered on the north celestial pole, and he proposed that the history of this configuration is the history of the ancient gods recorded in the fantastic stories, pictographs, ritual reenactments of the first star worshippers. A vast field of data is therefore available to the investigator. Remarkably, similar pictures of a sun in the sky revealed no similarity to our sun today. A pictographic crescent placed on the orb of the sun and a radiant star placed squarely in its center. The Universal Chronicles of the Cosmic Mountain, a pillar of fire, a light rising along the world axis, the myth of a central sun or a motionless sun at the celestial pole, identification of this ancient sun with the planet Saturn. In early astronomies, a radiant city or temple of heaven, providing the prototype for the sacred habitation of Earth. The global memories of a star goddess with long flowing hair, an angry goddess raging across the sky with wildly disheveled hair, threatening to destroy the world, a flaming serpent or dragon, disturbing the celestial motions or attacking the land. An ancestral warrior or hero born from the womb of the star goddess to vanquish the chaos serpent or dragon. Is it even possible that such diverse motifs could have a unified explanation? One fact remains uncontested after many years of publishing on this subject. The hypothesized planetary configuration does predict or account for hundreds of ancient themes never before explained. And at a level of detail or specificity, ah, there it is, specificity, there it is, at a level of detail or specificity, specificity, that could not be denied, indeed. I have gone so far as to brashly claim not a single general motif or ancient myth, ritual, or symbolism is left unexplained in the most straightforward way by the model. And that's what I mean when I say the model supports a general theory of ancient symbolism as a whole. It needs to be emphasized, therefore, that the historical argument for the polar configuration is fully testable against a massive historical record of nonsense. And I would hope that this will provide some assurance to those unnerved by the source material, ancient testimony. If the model is fundamentally incorrect, the experts on ancient myth and symbolism will have no trouble whatsoever refuting it. Find Deloria, author of the recently published book, Red Earth, White Lies, that Ted told me about when I talked to him, has asked a couple of questions which I would like to address, but not in one shot because the questions are too fundamental for that. I'd like to see if I can divide the issues into segments that could make for useful discussion. The Saturn theory arose from a historical argument in the sense that the argument relates to the human past as implied by the details of human memory in ancient times and by human artifacts. I shall offer this series of summaries as an exercise in clarifying the historical argument without the aid of visual presentation. One obvious and 
immediate question is whether something is as ambiguous as myth could actually qualify as evidence. The historical argument focuses on points of agreement in the memories of widespread races, suggesting levels of coherence, often missed by historians and anthrop anthropologists, and raising the possibility that this coherence arises from a core of human experience that has been missed as well. There is an overarching idea in this argument. We've not only misunderstood the past, we failed to recognize the consistency of ancient memory in pointing to extraordinary events never considered by modern science. John Cook said in his writings, mainstream science would have us believe that in the last two to four thousand years, nothing has happened. Remarkably, every motive of our early ancestors directs our attention to experiences impossible to comprehend in terms of any natural phenomena occurring today. This consistency will be seen even at the most fundamental levels of human memory and the most deeply rooted theme of the first civilization. The universal memory of a former age of the gods. The universal memory of an ancestral golden age, inaugurating the age of the gods. The universal memory of a celestial king of the world whose life inspired the ancestral leap into civilization. Descriptions of the gods as luminaries of immense size and power, wielding weapons of thunder and stone, the universal claim that the ancient world evolved by critical phases or cycle, punctuated by sweeping catastrophe. <laughs> Global traditions of gods and heroes ruling for a time then departing amid terrifying spectacles and upheavals. The frequently stated transfiguration of the departed gods into distant stars, the identification of these ruling gods with planets in the first astronomies, the relentless urge of star worshippers to draw pictures of celestial forms never seen in the sky, their desperate yearning to recover the semblance of a lost cosmic order, their collective efforts to replicate in architecture, the towering forms claimed to have existed in primeval times, their festive recreations. Through mystery plays and symbolic rites of cosmic violence and disorder, their reputation through ritual sacrifice of the deaths or ordeals of the gods, of the gods. Their brutal and ritualistic wars of expansion, celebrated as a reptilian or as a repetition of the cosmic devastation wrought in wars of the gods, the gods, the gods. It's more like a T, the gods. Such motives as these constitute, in fact, the most readily verifiable underpinnings of ancient ritual, myth, and symbol. How strange that in their incessant glance backwards, the builders of the first civilizations never remembered anything resembling the natural world in which we live. What is needed in the face of usual but widely repeated memories is brutal intellectual honesty. Amen Ra. How did human consciousness emerge from the womb of nature, converge on the same improbable ideas contradicting nature? For centuries we've lived under the illusion that our ancestors simply made up explanations of natural phenomena they didn't understand. That's not the problem. What the myth makers interpreted or explained through stories and symbols and ritual reenactments is an unrecognizable world, a world of alien sights and sounds, of celestial forms of cosmic spectacles and earth-shaking events that do not occur in our world. That is the problem. From an evaluation of the global themes of ancient cultures, we have hypothesized a world order never imagined by mainstream theory, a world in which planets moved on different courses, appearing huge in the sky. Heavens spanning celestial forms dominated human imagination to the point of obsession at the time of civilization's birth. Our contention will be that hundreds of ancient themes speak for a unified experience, an experience more specific in context and detail than any of us had ever imagined when we started our research. No universal theme stands alone or in isolation from any of the others. All are connected. All speak for the presence of coherent memory beneath the surface of seemingly random detail. In offering these summaries, I'm not asking or expecting anyone to embrace the extraordinary theory 
of planetary history involved only to consider highly interesting evidence that it is. One of the values of this reinterpretation of evidence is that the model works. It explains the subject matter, even if you do not for an instant believe that the suggested events occur. Merely discovering the active memory will throw remarkable new light on the ancient structures of human consciousness. In the course of these summaries, questions and challenges will be welcome, and whenever possible, I will try to incorporate these into the narrative as we go along. That's said David Talbot. And then it continues. A different aspect of the same story. That's what I was looking for. Corroboration, but not in verbatim. The story of the one. Some early Talbot from 97. other nearby planets, or sub-dwarf stars. Worlds with an opposing negative electrical potential with respect to Saturn would be attracted into resonant alignment during these close encounters. Eventually several planets, including Earth, Venus, and Mars, were steered and captured into an interplanetary configuration centered on Saturn. As planets locked in polar resonance with Saturn, they were simultaneously trapped in a second-order resonance with Jupiter and with each other. The Nice model suggests that when the system naturally evolved into a configuration in which the giant planets were locked in a quadruple resonance, the planets had to move in parallel to preserve the resonant configuration. All in all, according to David Talbot, the entire planetary configuration moved through a gaseous envelope extending perhaps several million miles from Jupiter. Jupiter was the apparent source of an interplanetary vortex within the gaseous envelope, a vortex powerful enough to bring the participating planets into alignment and to maintain the alignment in the face of the natural forces working against it. Incorporating all other gods who came near, Hesiod said, Kronos swallowed all his children but Zeus, intending to prevent the kingship of the gods from passing to any other of the majestic sons of heaven. Nice models and Saturnian scenarios alike have proposed that Uranus and Neptune also became integral components in the temporary stability of the planet's multi-resonant configuration. Inside the configurations encompassing magnetopause, the fixed stars would have been obscured by a cloudy, aurora-like phosphorescence. At the apex of this gloomy or rainy cave-like canopy stood the large central sun-like disk of hot, inflated proto-Saturn. Fragmentary memories worldwide similarly recall giant primordial figures embodying the whole of heaven, or indeed, the whole of creation. This phase appears to be synonymous with the protoplanetary Saturn Nebula recalled in a variety of esoteric lore as the primeval state of our solar system and the abode of the gods of former times at the top of the world. Talbot has conjectured that Jupiter was originally hidden behind Saturn. It is here proposed that this was indeed true for a good portion of the Saturnian Golden Age. Because Earth appears to have been the furthest body below the conjoined orbits of the other Saturnian planets, Earth would have been a considerable distance vertically below Jupiter also. In such an arrangement, Earth and its synchronous Saturnian companions 
would pass by Jupiter roughly once with every yearly revolution around the Sun. A visually distorted Jupiter may have been occasionally visible in the north skies when Jupiter and Saturn were near conjunction. Under such conditions, Jupiter would have appeared as a bright upturned crescent, horn, or sickle backlit by the Sun.